same way. No, I had to do the same thing. All right. Good evening, and everybody, and welcome to the November 16th Village of Woodbury Planning Board meeting. Sorry, everybody's still coming into a room. Oh, full house tonight. Uh, the planning board is holding this meeting because it is, has determined that the circumstances necessitating the emergency declarations by the governor for polio and monkeypox would affect or impair the ability of this public body to hold a meeting in person. With that said, I ask that everybody please rise for the pledge. I pledge allegiance, allegiance to the flag of the United, United, United States of America, America to the Republic, Republic for which stands one, one nation under God, God, God indivisible, liberty, with liberty and justice, justice for all. For all. Please be seated. Again, this is the November 16th Village of Woodbury Planning Board meeting. If you're not here for the planning board meeting, um, you're in the wrong place. First item on the agenda is the acceptance of the November 19th minutes. Has the board had a chance to review the minutes as provided? Yes. I'll offer a motion to accept those minutes as given by, by Tommy. Any questions? Yeah. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Okay. Next item, Bosley ARB. Review draft resolution for proposed ARB for sunroom addition to single family dwelling on the existing rear deck. Said property is located at 191 Roselawn Road in Highland Mills and is known as the Village of Woodbury Tax Maps, Section 213, Block 1, Lot 103. Okay. Has the board had a chance to look over the draft decision? Yes. Any questions, comments, or concerns? No. I just okay. have one update. Um, we did right. receive the report from uh, the Orange County Planning Department. So on page three, that will be revised. It's dated November 3rd, and it is a local determination. <laughs> Thank you very much. You'll, you'll, uh, I, I'm sure you'll update the resolution, right, Kelly? Yeah. Too? Yeah. Okay. Okay. So we'll get right into it. After several pages of facts and findings, um, the okay the applicant has demonstrated to the satisfaction of the village water department and village engineer that there is no increase in the use of water with this application and therefore it is exempt from the current building moratorium with after that we get into specific conditions no building permit shall be issued authorizing construction of structures inconsistent with the architectural renderings submitted to and approved by the architecture review board as part of this approval nor shall any certificate of occupancy issue for any structures constructed except in conformance with such renderings any deviations from such renderings will require further planning board review all new windows shall be constructed of coated with or coated with non-reflective material or anti-reflective window film will be applied to any new low E windows installed. Prior to the signing of the renderings, the application shall comply with the memorandum of the village engineer dated October 27th, 2022 to the satisfaction of the village engineer. Okay, I'll offer a motion uh, to accept the resolution, draft resolution of approval. Okay, second by Rich. Any questions? All no. in favor? Aye. Aye. Okay. Next item, Homewood Suites, review and discuss scoping document reviewed for site plan of a proposed 97 room hotel to include guest amenities, parking and associated utilities. Said property is located at New York State Route 32 and Turner Road in Central Valley and is known as the Village of Woodbury Tax Map to section 226 block one, lot 6.17 and eight. Um, I thought, Kelly, I thought tonight we just had to make the public aware that the scoping doc document was available or will be available on the website and that we're going to schedule a public scoping session in December. Yes. So that is the primary purpose that the scope is on the agenda. I would say that the applicant can save their presentation for the next meeting. Um, I did speak with counsel for the applicant today. Um, Stephanie, I told them that you had a, a light night tonight, so <laughs> that would be That's good. That's fine with me, Kelly. Um, okay. So the board just needs to notice, uh, notify the public just by saying it by me doing it right now that the scoping document is available on the website and then you just need to schedule the public scoping session for december 7th all right so i will offer a motion to schedule the public scoping session for the homewood suites application on december 7th second right, second by michael any questions 
All in favor? Aye. Aye. And well, also, Hagen, Hagen. Hagen. Oh, what I have a question. Yep. Uh, one of the participants is labeled just as iPhone. Can we know who that is? Well, when they want to speak, they'll identify themselves. Yeah, they don't. If, unless they're going to go on and make a public comment, they can. And they, as long as they don't uh, become rude, it's okay. Sometimes okay, some people you. don't rename their phone. So just for the next scoping session, um, all consultants, if for the board, um, should have their comments on the scoping document for the board for that December 7th meeting. As the board knows, what's most important at this point is that you are required to adopt a scoping document within 60 days of the receipt of this one. If not, a uh, seeker authorizes the applicant to prepare DEIS based on the scope that was submitted. So you want to make sure that it's done within 60 days. So if the consultants can have their comments to the board for December 7th, that'd be great. And then whatever feedback this board would like to discuss too, correct? On that same oh, date. So. Oh, absolutely. Right. I was just, because I know the, the consultants usually get theirs to you early. So yeah. Kelly, um, just touching base on that really quickly, I've we've started our review on the scoping document and are creating a red line version. So I think that should be done by the end of this week. Do you want to just kind of like pass that along between Phil and yourself and then create that? Absolutely. Okay. All right. Okay. So then... <laughs> Usually it starts with me and then I pass it along. So if you want to start with it, that is fantastic. Yeah, I don't have any issue with that since we already did. And I think that'll keep everything uh, in one place and <clears throat> just build off of it. And then um, is it appropriate also to um, let the public know that they can start submitting written comments or would that be, should we just defer that till the next meeting? Oh, they can certainly start submitting written comments now, um, but then we'll have the public scoping session which under seeker will give them the required opportunity to comment on the public scope. Right, so they'll have to December 14th to submit comments, I believe is the date. Well, it's December 7th, unless the board chooses to also receive written comments after the scoping session is closed. Okay. Usually you do, but yeah, you don't I was going to say we have in the past, we usually give seven days after mm -hmm. the public hearing to do that. Okay. All right. So anybody here that is anybody in the public, it should be able to go to the website. If not tonight, by tomorrow, the scoping document will be available for downloading for you guys, everybody to read. And then we will have a uh, public scoping session like we voted on on the 7th uh, for the public to give their feedback. If they do not wish to come to that meeting, they can just email their comments to the building department and they will be made a matter of the record as well. Okay, I think that's all on that tonight. The, the real work on that begins next meeting. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Have a good night. Next item on the agenda, KJ Water Treatment Facility, continuation of a public hearing for site plan approval of a proposed water treatment facility located at 147 Seven Springs Road in Highland Mills and is known as the Village of Woodbury Tax Map, Section 213, Block 1, Lot 49. Um, we still have not received any updated information from the applicant on this as well. Is there anybody here for the KJ, for the applicant for the KJ Water Treatment Facility? I didn't receive a letter from their council either. Now, if we close the public hearing, doesn't that trigger the 60 day action requirement? It, it does, um, but I will reach out to them. I think that they will agree to mutually extend that deadline and then request um, to reschedule the hearing that to reschedule the hearing at their request when they submit the additional information rather than have it continue from month to month because I mean, they're not here. They haven't asked for an adjournment. They haven't asked for anything. So I just don't want the board to take any action yet tonight other than to close the public hearing. And then we'll see um, what they do okay. to submit. And I'll reach out to them tomorrow. All right, cool. I just wanted to make sure, because I know once we close the public hearing that the clock starts ticking. So I don't want us, anybody to get into a spot. But no, sure it, well. it does. And that's a good point. Um, but do I just want to make sure before that- Before we close? I'm sorry? Do we need the agreement before we close? No, it really puts the pressure on them, not this board. Because if they didn't, so Mike, what would happen is if they didn't agree and the shot clock does start, this board would have to make a determination on their application based on what they've given to us thus far. So 
um, whatever they had promised to give us, whether it was different renderings, different colors, different samples, that stuff would not be null and void, would be just uh, rendered into the decision. We would just act on what we've been given to this point. Okay, thank you. So yeah, so just to be long-winded, so it's actually advantageous for them to agree to extend the deadline and not do it. Yeah. Does it make sense? They yes. prefer not to get denied, so that's why they'll likely agree to extend it. All right, so I'll offer a motion to close the public hearing on the KJ treatment facility. Second. Tommy, any questions? All mm -hmm. in favor? Aye. 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 All right, next item on the agenda, Orange County BMW. This is a public hearing for an amended site plan, special permit and architecture review board approval. Said property is located along Mayor Lane and Larkin Drive in Highland Mills, known as the Village of Woodbury tax map. Uh, section 225, block one, lots 10.421 and 10.4.2.1. This was published uh, in the publication of record on Friday, uh, November 11th. And then notices were also mailed out to the surrounding uh, property holders. All right. So I know, again, Natalie, this is one of those things uh, we did not get any new information. We were waiting for an updated lighting design from them, correct? Yes, that's correct. Um, I think that's the only uh, outstanding issue is just the revised lighting plan. And, um, you know, otherwise, I think that the plans were in a position for the board to potentially authorize a draft resolution of approval. But I think you wanted to see the plan, um, you know, in conjunction with that uh, decision. So that's the only outstanding issue. Okay, thank you. Uh, before I go to the public, uh, does anybody for this applicant uh, have any comments to make or know when we can expect the updated light uh, design? Yes, hi, my name is Peter Catazone with Catazone Engineering. Uh, with me is Sammy Osder with uh, Orange County BMW. He's a general manager and center controller <laughs> and has been in that position for 23 years. Uh, just to touch on the lighting real quick, we did receive this week an updated lighting plan. The two lights that, uh, the two areas that were of a concern is the northeast corner adjacent to Larkin. It's an existing uh, pole there with two lights on it. Uh, the designer lowered the, the light, the mounting height and uh, the same for the opposite side of the site, which is uh, the Northwest, which is adjacent to the commercial property uh, to the West and the same uh, situation there. So we will uh, give that information to this board. The, uh, the changes in the light level are significant. I think this board will be happy, but you will have that information to, to make that determination um, on your own. Do you think we'll have that sometime this week? We could give it to you uh, tomorrow. Okay. Well, it's the sooner the better because we can't take final action until the board has that to review. So we will submit that uh, to this board um, uh, tomorrow. We'll get you the appropriate hard copies and, and electronic copies. Okay. Thank you very much. With that, uh, I'm going to open up the public <laughs> hearing. Uh, this is a public hearing on Orange County BMW. Uh, if you wish to speak on this application, I ask that you unmute yourself, uh, give, state your first and last name and where you hail from, and direct your comments to the board. Second call for the Orange County BMW public hearing. Um, hello, my name is Danielle Corsello from Highland Mills. Hi, good evening. Um, I just actually wanted to just say that um, I'm a long-term customer of Orange County BMW, and I was just unclear as to why they were changing the look, and I think it's nice now, and I don't understand why they want to put stucco up. It is, I believe it is part of a corporate rebrand, uh, corporate rebranding uh, of the company, of the organ, the dealership, correct, Sammy? Uh, that is correct. We currently have Metal Alucaban on it. Um, and uh, they are required to go back to EFIS, which is when we had originally built um, and opened up Orange County BMW in 2004. Um, a lot of people do feel that it is a downgrade from the Lukabon look, and I'm not sure that we can um, get around it at this point in time. All right, so it is a corporate requirement for them to, I guess, probably to be, to stay as a part of a dealership, right? Whatever yep. your yep. contractual. Franchise, your contractual French 
franchise app uh, requirements. Correct. And Chris, as you've mentioned before, <clears throat> we've had similar um, situations like with Chile's where they had to change the outside because of the corporate change. Yep. Danielle, does that answer your question? Thank you, yes. You're welcome. Anybody else wishing to speak on the Orange County BMW application? Third and final call for the Orange County BMW application. All right, I'll offer a motion to close the Orange County BMW. Public Second. Hearing. Second by Michael. Any questions? All in favor? Aye. 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 Uh, does the board feel we are in a position to have council uh, draft a resolution of approval contingent on the lighting contingent plan? Contingent on the lighting, yes. Contingent yes. on the lighting? Yep. That's right. move. Yes. Mike moves. Second by Evan. Any questions? All in favor? Aye. 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 All right. So, like I said, Sammy and Pete, get the get that into us tomorrow so that the board can and the consultants can look it over and we can move the the application to resolution. Thank you so much. Have a good night. Thank you very much and thank you for your support. Have a good you're welcome. Have a good night, gentlemen. Thank you. And happy Thanksgiving. Happy Thanksgiving. Definitely, absolutely. Well, so I'll make the blanket. Happy Thanksgiving to everybody celebrating this way. I if what I forget <laughs> later in the day, nobody can say I didn't wish it to anybody. <laughs> uh -huh. Uh, next item on the agenda, Fisher, public hearings for site plan and ARB <laughs> review submitted for a two-lot subdivision application involving ARB and Ridge Preservation Review. Said property is located 7 Scott Monk Road in Highland Mills and is known on the Village of Woodbury tax maps, section 204, block 1, lot 36.2. Again, this was noticed in the Times Herald record on February, November 11th, 2022, and notifications were sent out to surrounding property holders via U.S. mail. Um, so again, Natalie, I don't think we have anything outstanding as far as reports go. Uh, no, 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 no new materials were received, uh, since the applicant's last appearance, although, uh, there are a number of outstanding comments on the application materials. So there should be, um, another submission, uh, we believe with your board, uh, to review prior to any action. Although I did want to just, uh, point out my carryover memo discusses, um, a certain deadline for acting after closing the public hearing, but, um, I did confirm with Kelly today and I should have thought about this before I prepared the memo. This application is subject to the moratorium. So, um, all actions would be stayed until that issue is resolved, um, with the village board or, um, Oh, well, essentially with the village board. Yeah. All so right. either they get a waiver or the moratorium is lifted either. Right. Exactly. Either way. So basically the clock stops on that. From the yeah. We, we're not, we're not held accountable because okay. of the building moratorium. So um, the applicant should work towards submitting revised materials to address those comments. So we can resolve those with the board. Yep. Uh, hello everyone. Hi, Chris and the board members. We uh, are fully aware of the comments. Your audio is not very good. Yeah, I, I have a really bad sore throat, so I'm sorry about that. <laughs> I'll, do, I'll do my best. Have some tea. So, thank you. Uh, we, um, we are aware of the comments. Uh, they were uh, heavily based in survey uh, material, and uh, we are awaiting updates from the surveyor so that we can fine tune our site plans and make that submission. Okay. It's my understanding that would be it's going to be short. It's going to be coming in the very near future. So I'm hoping to make a resubmission, a final submission, very soon. Okay, and that's just just I'm sure you're aware, David. Even once you get that in, and we we do if we do authorize the drafting of a resolution, we can't take action on that until either you have a waiver from the village board for the water or the moratorium is uh, lifted. Just everybody's aware of that as well. All right, any other comments from consultants of board before I go out to the public on this one? Okay, I will open the public hearing for the Fisher uh, site plan and ARB, two lot subdivision. Again, same thing, if you wish to speak, just unmute yourself, uh, state your name and where you hail from and your comments to the board. Good evening, this is Kristen Campione. Can you hear me? Yep, we can hear you. Oh, great. I'm on. Um, good evening. I'm, uh, I live at Four Lent Drive in Highland Mills. 
Okay. And just the two really questions that I have is, I was just curious because I had called the town and um, this was a, months ago and I wasn't able to get an answer. Um, when was that zoned for two, uh, one acre lots to be subdivided? Because I know when we first moved in, we looked to purchase that property a little while after and it was still two zone lots. So I'm just curious when it switched over that it was zoned for one acre lots. I'm not, do you, Kelly or Natalie, do either one of you know off the I top of your head? don't know off the top of my head. I'm, I'm trying to look really quick now, but I'm not, I'm not sure right now. Okay. Is there something that I could follow up like with the town tomorrow or in the coming days and ask for anyone specific? Because again, um, when it first went up for sale before the Dabneys, the prior owner from the Dabneys, and that's the owner prior to the Fishers, um, it was at that point still um, two acre subdivisions. So again, I'm just curious when the switchover happened. Um, I don't have, unfortunate, you know, I don't have the specific years that I'm speaking of. Yeah, so I can, I can try and look. Um, why don't you, can you send an email to Maria Rubio in the building department and she can get in touch with me and I can try and see what I can find out to see when it was zoned as R1A. Um, I'm not sure I'm going to be able to get an answer, but only because it depends on if it was pre-village, if it was in the town. I, I'm just not sure right now, but I can certainly look and try and get you some information on that. Okay, terrific. Yeah, that would be awesome. And then just the other comment I had was um, when the when the the current owners uh, recently bought the land, we saw the surveyors out on our property as well but we never noticed any um, uh, survey pins or markers or anything as far as um, getting the, the lay of the land. The getting the, um, I can't think of the word. Oh my gosh. Like the boundaries Boundary you're talking about? Boundaries. Boundaries. Thank you. Um, typically, from what I remember, they only they only stake the corners of the boundaries of the property, <laughs> and um, they're not they're not out. They're definitely not there. Well, I don't think there's actually technically a, a requirement for them for them to actually put the stakes in the in the ground. Correct, Natalie or Kelly? So some of the property markers could be existing, and it could just be like a nail in the ground, something that you wouldn't really be visible yeah. to like the naked eye unless you did some digging and how surveyors would locate that would be, you know, with some kind of, uh, you know, magnetic detector type of thing. Um, David, I don't know if you were out in the field with the surveyor, if you can discuss a little bit more about, you know, how those were delineated for them to produce their mapping. Um, but also, uh, as far as the subdivision goes, typically uh, we would require monuments and and staking of again the property corners, like you mentioned, Chris. Um, you know, for the purposes of that issue in the future, so that the surveyors could locate it um, for any reason. I agree. But as far as you don't know what monuments they used when they did the original I, survey, right, David? I, I tell you, I, um, I'm looking at the survey right now, and I... I know for, like, my property, I, I have, like, co there's concrete underneath the monuments, actually underneath my lawn, that they buried when they, they put my, did my subdivision. So sometimes they're not always uh, visible. Uh, we've seen surveys before they, you know, this fence post or this cover or this telephone pole, like they've used objects that not necessarily um, you would think would be a marker for a property line. But before um, the building, is this something that's going to be required that it does have to be visible? Yes, they'll have to mark the limit, what they call the limits of disturbance and the and the boundary lines uh, before they start disturbing the land. Um, that'll be a requirement that the building inspector will 
make sure they come in because they have to. There's also um, other things called silt fencing and uh, stuff they'll have to put in and w rainwater control and stuff. So they just can't go in and willy nilly start digging because the building department's going to come out with a set of plans and they're going to look uh, at that set of plans and they're going to look for those stakes in the ground to uh, make sure that they are following the plans that were submitted and uh, signed off by this board. So no, they just won't come in with the bulldozer and clear the land out. Go ahead, David. I believe there are a few iron rods that were located uh, as monuments or newly staked, I could see on the site plan. Uh, in addition to that, I agree with the board or with Chris's comments. During the construction phase aspect of the project, there'll be construction surveying. So the property lines and the property corners will be visibly staked. And as mentioned earlier, uh, uh, no grading would, pro would be able to occur until that happens. I do think though, uh, the survey is that you just saw recently had to do with locating the sewer lines in the street. That might be uh, a possibility because we were <coughs> asked to locate those uh, services and utilities. And that was the most recent event for the survey crew to be out at Scunning Monk to do that type of work. As I hope that, I know we didn't give you an answer to your first question, but I hope that answers your uh, second question uh, satisfactorily. Uh, yes, it does. Thank you so much. You're welcome. And, and, you, and, have the, and you, you have the email address for the building department? I don't, but I was just, I'll just call in the morning and I could get it. Then. Okay, very good. Right, and, and Kristen, you were talking about talking to the town. You really need to talk to the village. The village. Right. With respect to the zoning. Zoning, planning board, all of this are village issues. Okay. I just... so, the, so that first question I had, I'm directing it towards the village. Yes. Yes. Okay. Uh, Kristen, I just sent you a, a chat message that has the phone number for the building department and the email address for the building department. Thank you so much. I appreciate that. You're welcome. Any other uh, comments on the Fisher public hearing? Unmute yourself and state your name, please. I like this. I like public participation. It's, yes. it's rare that we get That's people nice. to come out and ask questions. Um, second call for the Fisher public hearing. The last and final call for the Fisher public hearing. Okay, I will offer a motion to close the public hearing. Second by Rich, any questions? All in favor? Aye. Aye. Okay, so David, you got your homework, so we'll look for your next submission. As always a pleasure and everyone have a great holiday season coming up. We'll hope to see you soon. See you soon. You too, sir. You too. Feel better. Thank you. Moving right along. Hartman, ARB, 2224 Catskill High Rail. Review oh. and discuss application submitted for amended site plan, special permit, ridge preservation, and ARB, a proposed shul application to a single family dwelling. Said property is located at 22 and 24 Catskill High Rail. It is known as the Village of Woodbury Tax Maps, Section 254. Lot seven, lot one, and lot two. Oh, I think uh, I think this application hit on everything: site plan, special permit, ridge as ARB. We got all. We got we got them all tonight. All right. Good evening, sir. How are you? Hi. How are you? Good. Good. Okay. Um, you just want to do the you know customary just you know quick review of the project and then we'll go from there, sir. <clears throat> yes. Just. To give. First, thanks everyone for giving us the opportunity to represent the project tonight. So, I just um, to give a general um, overview of what we want to do here. So, basically, we want to have an addition to an existing single family home for a shul and mikveh um, for the community. Um, and basically, this was actually in front of the board a few years ago um, and actually approved to have in the, it was originally in, in the basement of the single family house um, to have a shul and mikveh. And 
it was one condition to provide parking and the applicant was back and forth with the village to be able to put parking on the other 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 property so now they bought the other property and um and we going to merge we actually merged the two properties and we're planning to put the parking on the other other property because the restriction is not for parking only for um only, only for putting any any structure so we're gonna have the addition next to the existing house and the parking on the other property so let me give you if i can share my screen just to give a, a overview of the uh, booklet we have submitted yep give me one second to give you uh permission okay you should be able to okay Okay, so basically we have here um, 15 pages. The first page is just to give the a, a 3D rendering. As you see, we have focused to keep the existing colors of the house and it should comply with the colors in general um, with the surrounding um, houses. This is to see the building from the roundabout. You can see the background from the existing, it's actually photo. And this is the back facing Adelic, um, basically, which um, we're going to add a retaining wall here. Um, it was now it's a steep slope. Now we're going to straighten out the property and put a retaining wall here. This is just to show where it is on the tax map and the zoning map. And this is the existing house now, which basically here we're going to come up with an extension. And this is to view the existing um, conditions of the property now from the other sides and from the back. And this is some of surrounding house and the nature of the surrounding. And this is to demonstrate the view corridor to see that it's from this side, it's um, don't see to seem to us that you're gonna be able to see that. So I want to take it away from the each provision. This is the general site plan, which this is the existing house. And this is the property, the old property line, which will be removed. And the parking will be from Adelaide Drive. And we're going to have a retaining wall here. And actually, we're going to add on the 3D, we're going to put planting here. So we'll not see down. This is basically the floor plans. Um, it's actually, it's actually um, this is the first floor. We can have to resubmit um, with a corrected one. This is a, mis this is a mistake. And this is um, from the existing house. And this is on top of the addition. We're gonna extend the house of the, of the rabbi. Um, and this is the 2D elevations it's the same as the 3d this is basically the the overview of the project if any questions um i'm here to answer okay so the plan is for the rabbi still to say in the in the building correct sir correct correct okay um it's it's good that you guys are getting the other lot because i know there's some parking problems over there i've gone past in the morning and there's mm -hmm. Looks like the Dukes of Hazard drove minivans everywhere. They're, they're <laughs> parked all over the place. Um, so now we can have 16 parkings. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna take the. It's gonna take, the, take care um, of it. The retaining wall, that big retaining wall on the back. Are you guys gonna put any kind of a rail or a fence or something to stop anybody from free falling? Okay, so let me tell you that this application was submitted uh, a few weeks ago. In the meantime um we have also scheduled um on december 7 a meeting and we have a lot of uh materials and a lot of, and, and a lot of comments we have received from the building department to address it was not able to address it before this um okay. meeting so on december 7 um we're gonna make the submittal on the 28 which is 10 days before i think 28 of the date 
um, we hope to have as a middle with more clear. Um, we are going to have the, the material of the retaining wall on the 3D and the fencing and the landscaping and all, also all comments, which we're going to try to address um, from the H2M comments and from the building department, what we have received. But this okay. is the old submission. So this is just okay. an overall view of the project. Okay, good. And then you got the comments from Colliers as well, right? Yes, yes. So you should have a yes. gift two comment letters? Okay, good. Yes, I have both. Okay. All right, so I'll I'll keep my feedback until we get the, the new submission because I know there was some work that had to be done on it. Um, does the board have any comments for the applicant uh, applicant before I go to Natalie and Phil? No. Oh, wait. Okay. You want to go ahead, Natalie? You want to you want want a glass of water before you start? <laughs> <laughs> no, that's okay. And I'll try to be brief. Um, Mr. Gelb sort of or you know did a good job describing uh, the plan and what was approved previously and how this application changes from that 2020 approval, including the new lot. Um, so I'll again try to just be very brief about all of this. Uh, the first thing I wanted to discuss with the board, and I think Kelly um, can confirm maybe tonight or at the future at a future meeting is that um, the second lot that we're talking about um, was previously accepted for dedication by the village board. Um, the county tax records indicate that Woodbury Villas still owns that lot, but uh, we understand that the property has been deeded to 24 Catskill High Rail and that's the and that the two lots are in common ownership. Um, we did want have a question and recommend that it be confirmed whether or not there were any restrictions associated with the transfer of that lot among entities. Um, you know, just in the event that uh, the village board, you know, dedicated it to Woodbury Villas and said, you know, it could never be developed as parking or something like that. If that ever happened, I don't know. If that's just speculatory. But so I will look for Kelly to confirm that. Um, we did receive a partially executed combination of lots form. Uh, so our comments were prepared, assuming that the lots were in a combined state. Um, we did request an opinion from the building inspector on the status of the lots after combination, and he's determined that it would be considered a corner lot. So as the applicant is revising their plans, they should consider uh, that finding and um, essentially the restrictions on the bulk criteria. Uh, with a corner lot, there would be two front yards, one rear and one side. Um, since the site's going to be developed to support two uses, the lot has to satisfy the combined area requirements of each use and the bulk regulations for each. Uh, so that uh, compliance for both of those should be demonstrated on the plan. Um, our memo provides some guidance on the requirements of the co conservation cluster overlay district for which the uh, lot and areas WP3 resides in. So the applicant should consider that in their next plan submission. Uh, we've asked for justification for the proposed 16 parking spaces and calculations that demonstrate that need based on the gross floor area and the number of seats proposed. Uh, projected water and sewer demand form needs to be provided uh, with supporting calculations. And uh, one of our comments had requested the applicant confirm if a MICFO was also proposed as part of this, which they have now. Uh, so the calculations should consider if there are any impacts as part of that uh, part of the use. Um, the existing and proposed water and sewer services should be shown on the plan. Uh, the board considered conditions of the prior approval associated with uh, signage and restrooms or in appropriate locations uh, regarding the proper and improper disposal of materials. Uh, so we'll recommend a similar condition of this current action if you move to approval. Uh, with respect to stormwater management, uh, we've asked the applicant to confirm the area of disturbance is less than one acre. Um, the, which would exempt the, them from preparing a full SWIP. Um, however, based on the proposed addition and parking areas, we believe that the applicant should provide erosion and sediment control and post-construction stormwater management controls for the site. Um, that's all listed in our memo. Um, we did note that according to the original subdivision plans, there was supposed to be a storm drain that connected and crossed actually lot 7-1. Uh, from Adelaide Fairway to Catskill High Rail. So if that exists, it should be confirmed and potentially an easement uh, provided. Um, Chris, you discussed the retaining walls already. Uh, we included some conditions from the original WP3 approval. So the applicant will need to confirm compliance with those as well as requirements of your code. Um, 
we've asked the applicant to, to discuss their plan for management of snow, um, confirm compliance with ADA criteria and access to the shoal. Um, there are certain provisions of your code for landscaping associated with a front landscaped area, as well as screening of the parking lots. Uh, the applicant should comply with that or seek relief. A lighting plan will be provided at a later date. Um, with respect to ARB, a lot of the materials that you would typically request have been provided. Uh, we did ask for a table of floor areas for you to consider the area that's designated to the shul and the area that's designated to the residents. And we also typically recommend that a table be provided comparing the building footprint and gross floor area of this proposed development to similar and surrounding uh, neighbors for you to consider your similarity and dissimilarity criteria. Uh, we had some minor comments on the ARB form and some information that should be updated and added to that. Uh, the renderings uh, you've seen now tonight, um, as well as the photos of the neighboring homes. So our memo just recommends that you review these and consider whether or not the colors and the architectural accents, and particularly around the windows, um, you know, are similar or dissimilar, dissimilar to other uh, development in the area. Uh, we also noted that the roof colors are different uh, based on the rendering from the existing and the proposed addition. So we just recommend that the applicant confirm that that's their intent um, and if not revise the rendering. Um, and then also with respect to ridge preservation, just kind of noting for the board's uh, information as the prior review, you determined that the site would not be visible from the view corridor. Additionally, the applicant has um, provided some of that material demonstrating the visibility from the view corridor. Uh, so at the appropriate time, you can consider that. Um, and then we've also asked the applicant to discuss their plan for refuse collection. There's no dumpster areas shown on the plan. Um, it's not clear if that's needed at this point. Um, and then an EAF needs to be provided for you to consider seeker. And then I said I would be brief, but I wasn't so brief. <laughs> and <laughs> there are a number of other details that need to be provided. So we'll just wait for a revised plan to continue to comment on this issue. Thank you, Natalie. So Kelly, I have a procedural question because in order to keep the momentum here working. The November the, of 2019, though I signed it, um, became null and void because it was never executed within a year because one of the conditions or two of the conditions were never met. The That's original right. shul approval had some substantial burden waivers attached to it. Are those, do they those need to resubmit? should be reaffirmed. I was if, gonna say, but, no. well, there's two, well, because we're not gonna, we're not 100% sure until the next middle comes in, what potential waivers they may or may not be. Are, is, so do we need a whole new substantial burden if they're requesting waivers from this board, or do we just need a updated substantial burden waiver letter for the new, um, variances, and I, I don't, variances is the right word right here, but, um, that may be needed. It depends on what they're submitting and that they're going to need a substantial burden waiver for. If it's the same as the prior application, then you can reaffirm those, but I think some of them might be slightly different, um, right. with the additional parking lot. So in that respect, the new request as it would, um, apply to the entire facility, both both properties, whatever requests they need, to the extent that they're different from what was previously requested, should be requested from this board with, you know, a simple request saying, also, if this one was applicable to the last one, we restate that request. Okay. Yeah, because it's going to change now because we're merging two lots, the lot area is changing. So I think yeah. maybe there was, and I'm just trying to remember it was a couple of years ago I can't even remember what I had for dinner two hours ago if there was some lot coverage I know there was some parking waivers not 100 percent sure if there was some lot coverage or anything that was required so um just for the applicants you know edification to, to help keep things moving in a forward process here what yeah. you know so basically I think what we're getting at Mr. Gelb is that when you look at the submittal um, you're going to know from your tables what you need for if you need a waiver for parking, if you need a waiver for lot coverage or side yard or rear yard setback. Um, for you, it's best just to get that letter going. And, you know, you do have two options here, right? You can either ask for a substantial burden under the Religious Land Use Act, or you can go to the ZBA and ask for them for relief as well. So that's in your court. 
um, both options, but just wanted to spell that out and just let everybody know that, uh, you know, that's what we have to do here as well, that there is a federal law in place that allows the applicant, because this is a religious use, to uh, ask for exemptions from certain parts of the zoning code of uh, the village of Woodbury. Mm -hmm. So actually, we're going to have um, some new um, zoning um, variances, what we're going to need. Um, we're going to need the 20 feet um, rear yard um, setback um, variance. Okay, so. So yeah, Thanks spell that you. all out. If you have a copy of the old letter, if not, I guess ask the building department for the old substantial burden as a template and just, you know, list whatever it is that you need in that letter. Uh, you're going to ask this board for relief from um, so that we can just continue to process everything and we don't, you know, get bogged down and waiting for stuff to come come to front of this board. I know. Okay, thanks so uh, much. Okay, yep. so we'll, Hold we'll on. do we that. Still got Mr. We still okay. got Mr. Greeley. We still got Mr. Greeley. But he's Phil, I'm going to. He's lurking in the background. I'm going to so, jump Phil for just a second. I just want to, while it's fresh in everybody's mind, um, address Natalie's two questions or two issues. The property was transferred. Um, to 24 Catskill. So I checked it. The county's website is wrong, but the deed was filed. So you don't need to worry about that. However, the one thing I do want to say is that when the village transferred the property, it was for purposes of use as a parking lot. And they specifically said in the transfer, no buildings or structures shall be permitted to be constructed thereon. So the property was transferred to them for parking purposes, which actually I think addresses their substantial burden requests from the last application because I, I just pulled up the resolution and I think then it was just parking. Um, so hopefully that takes care of that one, but they'll submit the letter um, that you were just talking about, Chris, for whatever they do need for this new application. Okay. And that was it, Phil, now it's yours. Now, with, without further ado. Yeah. Good evening, everybody. So uh, our November 9th letter, which I believe Mr. Gelb has, um, had five items. Number one is just a, a real detailed breakdown of the number of attendees, the number of you know uh, people that will be here at the facility, um, and and that ties into you know what the trip generation is, and and also how you anticipate you know uh, how they're going to arrive. Walking, are they going to arrive by van? Are they going to arrive by car, by taxi? And, and that's really kind of a, a description of, of how you anticipate that to occur. And, and that leads into some of the other items, such as you know, the adequacy of the parking, uh, because that's going to drive the, the use of the parking spaces. Uh, the access to your parking from Adelaide uh, needs to be looked at in terms of site distances for vehicles entering and exiting. And especially, I believe you had a retaining wall in that area. So you need to take that all into account. Any signing or any other uh, improvements that might be necessary relative to that. And then relative to pedestrian uh, movements to the property is to uh, kind of identify those paths. And you know, are there gonna be a need for any crosswalks, any signing? So it's all tied to the operation and how it will function. Um, and, you know, the, the again, the, the adequacy of the parking that Natalie referred to is gonna be driven by the answers to, you know, the number of attendees, how you expect people to arrive, et cetera. So we may have some other comments after you provide that information, uh, but those are kind of the key components that we need to be able to assess it okay so for of, of, of course we're going to provide all this information right. i actually we have here michael morganti on the this call he's a site engineer on, on this project so he's gonna provide all this stuff on the site plan and hopefully for the december 7th meeting we're gonna grab we, we, we we're gonna gather all the information and we're gonna be able to discuss and to hear the comments on that. Okay. Okay. Does anybody from the board have any other questions for Phil or Natalie or the applicant on this application? No. All right. Uh, then, Mr. Gulp, we look forward to seeing you after your next submission, sir. 
Yes. Okay. Thank you so much. And we'll be back on December 7th. All right. Have a good night, sir. Next item on the agenda, Woodbury Townhouse. Review and discuss revised plans and materials submitted for site plan, special permit, A or B, and water protection overlay of, of uh, proposed 12-unit townhouse. Said properties located 6, 8, and 10 Falkirk Avenue in Central Valley and is known as the Village of Woodbury Tax Maps, Section 213, Block 3, Lots 6.1, 6.2, and 7. All right. Good evening, Jay and team. How is everybody? We're fine. Thank you. Mr. Morganti is here with me. Thank okay. you. How's everybody doing tonight? Good. How are you, sir? You want to uh, bring us up to uh, speed since you last been before in front of us? Before yeah. us. I mean, so um, so what we did here since we were last before the board was we, we put together um, a grading plan and I also put together a stormwater management plan. We took a closer look at um, well, let me re let me rephrase that. Um, I did some stormwater calculations to preliminarily size what I've got shown here on the plan, but they weren't uh, in a state to be submitted yet. They were just for sizing purposes for for the plan development. But we will be saying that sometime soon in the future. Um, <clears throat> so we took a little bit of a closer look at these riparian buffers. Um, we mapped them more closely. We showed what those uh, setbacks were. We tried to provide some more detail on the fill that would be required within any of the uh, riparian zones. Um, and we essentially uh, updated the EAF and have made that resubmittal for you uh, for your review. Um, you know, there, as Natalie had noted in her um, comment letter, there's still a lot of threshold issues for us to consider here. I can't really progress this plan uh, that much more further than what's shown here other than to have a discussion with the board tonight about some of the comments that are on that comment letter, try to flesh out um, uh, maybe a better way forward would be a better way to classify that. Okay. So Natalie, you wanna just dive right in then? Sure. Um, so the application was last before you in July and those threshold issues that Mike is referring to um, are primarily associated with the water quality protection overlay and also um, certain compliance issues with zoning. So variants are based on the applicant's current plan needed for density and parking in the front yard. So the planning board could consider a referral to the ZBA for the same. Um, with respect to seeker, you previously declared your intent to be lead agency, you declared the action unlisted. Um, assuming that there have been no objections to your lead agency status, we believe you can affirm that. Um, we also know council has prepared a part two EAF for you to consider in your advancement of seeker. Um, with respect to water and sewer, there are some additional details uh, that we've requested regarding the service connections. Um, the application is subject to the moratorium. Um, and although we take no exception to the calculations that were provided, we'll wait uh, to review the plans and form with the water and sewer administrator until some more details are provided. Uh, with respect to sewer service, our comment letter notes that the proximity proximity to the development um, or of the development to Woodbury Creek and within the floodplain, uh, there should be particular attention to water tightness of those proposed facilities. Uh, we did make some recommendations in that regard on our memo. Uh, Mike already kind of mentioned that, um, you know, some calculations have been performed associated with the stormwater management facilities. At your last meeting, you requested a SWIP, uh, which is permi permitted uh, of the board to consider under the water quality protection overlay. Um, we talk a little bit in our memo about grading and the net disposition of soils and why they're important for you to consider impacts during construction. Additionally, fill within the floodplain is important uh, for you to consider impacts to flood patterns and changes to the same. Um, so additional information will need to be provided by the applicant um, and a no-rise condition post-development for this to move forward. Uh, lighting and landscaping plan, again, remains to be provided. Um, but I think getting to really those threshold considerations are this uh, development within the riparian zone, which is restricted under your code, um, except for uh, after a public hearing, the planning board makes certain findings, uh, which are listed in our memo, um, and some of those have to do with um, there are no practical alternatives uh, weighed against the need of the community, 
uh, after the planning board has considered the loss in the protection of the water supply, uh, consideration on the ability of the applicant to develop the property, considering other uses permitted under zoning and uh, minimized risk and consideration of alternatives. So um, our memo discusses some of those recommendations and things for the planning board to consider um, including, you know, a reduced intensity. I think the original uh, proposal was for nine buildings. Now it's for 12. Three of those buildings are within the riparian zone. So if those three buildings were either excluded from the plan or potentially relocated um, adjacent to 10, 11, and 12, um, that may avoid disturbance in the riparian area. Uh, so that's something that the planning board can consider with the applicant. Um, certainly, you know, it's the applicant's plan, so they should, um, you know, provide some alternatives for you to consider as well. Um, so that's one of the things that I wanted to discuss with you. Uh, the other issue is construction with the within the buffer area. So again, the applicant also provided some information to the board regarding, you know, how much area of disturbance in each of those, you know, riparian and buffer areas proposed, as well as the fill that's proposed within each of those areas. And to their point, um, a lot of this site is encumbered by the riparian and buffer areas. Um, you know, I think in some ways they've tried to shift it a little bit, but, um, you know, there may be an opportunity for improvement. Um, so Mike can kind of discuss sort of their stance on that, um, you know, if appropriate or if the planning board would like to hear it. Um, but also with respect, again, to the buffer area, there are certain provisions for the planning board to consider, um, again, minimizing impacts, disturbance, and impervious, impervious surfaces. Uh, so we've suggested that you consider each of those criteria in your code, um, you know, and, and sort of discuss those with the applicant. Um, again, another issue, just again, uh, kind of touching base on this floodplain issue is the project is entirely within the 100-year floodplain. Uh, we've asked for the floodway boundary to be shown on plan. Uh, floodway, a floodplain development permit is going to be required. Um, and then I, I think the rest of our memo is really just additional details uh, that should be provided as the project progresses. So um, just to kind of recap those threshold things, uh, you know, one is the referral to the ZBA for the issues associated with um, zoning. And then the other is consideration with the applicant, some of all those alternatives that could be explored for avoiding the riparian area and then um, minimizing disruption to the buffer area. If, if I could just uh, make one comment, I, I think it's a pretty practical solution to shift building seven, eight, and nine adjacent uh, to 10, 11, and 12, which would pull us completely out of the, the 50 foot riparian buffer. Um, I think that's a that's a that's an easy lift for us to do, and it, and it makes sense for that to be done. Yeah, I think that, that was the most most of the disturbance was really associated with just those built that building or the three buildings together. So, um, and that also opens up the back a lot for us to put a proper um, refuse storage location there and a snow dump area. So um, it, it makes lots of sense for us to relocate seven, eight, and nine over by where ten, eleven, and twelve are if the board and the consultants are in agreement with that. So, Natalie, the development in the floodplain, uh, I got on the board when this was just being discussed from the original, the other application, the nine unit application. And there, and there was public testimony and members of the board at the time that during Irene, this this lot had actually flooded, was was underwater. How do we, I mean, to me, that needs to be addressed, right? Because if you're going to have stormwater management, under, underwater filtration, how does, if it, this, we know this area has the potential to flood, that means those facilities could get overwhelmed and wiped out and become useless, right? And that also means that any sort of materials that are stored on the ground floor could then be uh, leaked into the Woodbury Creek because that water is, that water body is right there, right? So there are well, certain, yeah, certain requirements um, that the applicant will have to construct the building at a certain elevation above the floodplain. Um, I think as part of the prior approval, there was like flow through um, ports at the building foundations or, you know, basically below where like an actual residential area would be. Some of those things are definitely going to be considered as the application progresses. Um, 
But ultimately, uh, I think another requirement of the floodplain development permit that I keep kind of mentioning in our memo is this no rise certification. So any fill that's proposed on the site can't then offset flood waters to cause flooding of other areas nearby. Um, so that's another really important thing to consider. Um, so, I mean, certainly those are all really great points and definitely need to be addressed. Um, you know, and I think the app, Mike was the prior engineer for the prior application. So he's familiar with, um, you know, those specific requirements and sort of the hurdle that he faces to um, comply with them. Yeah, and, and under the previous stormwater uh, plan we had provided, I believe we had a flood or tide gate um, shown on the outlet for um, uh, the culvert pipe that discharges to Woodbury Creek. Um, as one of the measures so that when the creek rises, it wouldn't necessarily back up through the system that way. Um, but the, the the parking lot and the catch basins and the stormwater system essentially probably during a hundred year storm event will be underwater. Um, they will be. So then all the sediment, so what stops all the sediment and stuff that's in the underground uh, stormwater management system from being flushed in into the creek? Um, well, I think what would happen is uh, your tide gate prevents any water from the creek backing up into the system. Um, if there are any sediments inside uh, the actual stormwater management system, well, there will be sediments inside there. Uh, those sediments really won't go anywhere until the Woodbury Creek um, declines in elevation as a storm event continues to um, decline. Uh, and then what would happen is that water within the uh, system itself would essentially um, also decline, and any of those sediments that are in there would settle at the bottom. Bottom back of the stormwater back management system. Settle right back into the bottom of the stormwater system. Interesting. And then the, and I'm going to apologize for the thousands of questions, or not thousands, we're not going to be here all night. But so the first floor would be like what you see in the um, coastal communities almost, that uh, like it's a storage space that can actually be a habitable space because it's in a floodplain or is it just like a, a, a two foot, like walk us through a little bit more how the, the are, bottom these, part of that building is put these, together. These are, these are essentially slabs on grade. So, but what will happen is you will have exposed foundations uh, around certain portions of, I should say a foundation, frost wall would be a, probably a better description for it, um, around certain portions of the buildings um, simply because we're trying to avoid placing fill in that in that area. So um, what we would do for those crawl spaces is we would allow, as Natalie uh, mentioned earlier, we would have some type of flow through ports uh, so that water can come into that space and actually come out of that space. So that and, and, and the benefit to that also is that when we're calculating fill within the floodplain, we're technically only calculating the volume of the concrete that's associated with that foundation wall. Um, so it also helps us in terms of um, minimizing any fill that we're placing within the floodplain. Okay. Interesting. Anybody else from the board? Questions, comments, concerns on Natalie's? You muted, Tommy. You're on mute. There you go. Natalie, you attached a, a previous memo. It looks from looks like from the old building inspector from May of seventeen. Do any of his findings still carry through? onto this application? Yeah, I think actually um, most of them do. So at the last meeting, we discussed um, the lot area and net lot area, and that was my mistake. Um, I think I was thinking like commercial residential would be subject to those calculations, but then lo and behold, there was a determination by the building inspector <laughs> that said otherwise. So that one is applicable. Um, the zoning district lines, uh, uh, this has been rectified. I believe that um, the property was converted as entirely HB by the village board. I think that's true. Yep. That's and true. then the bulk table, that was one thing that we've asked uh, for confirmation that it does carry through, um, although we do think it's uh, appropriate that it would. Um, so that was one of our kind of deferrals to Kelly. Okay. Sorry, I was just curious, being you know, previous building inspector, do we need new interpretations or anything? Or... No, the uh, determinations of the prior building inspector stand, unless the new building inspector comes in and says, "Wait, I have a new determination 
that's wrong. So the prior interpretations stand. Okay, thank you. So procedurally, Kelly, um, we've only dealt with one of other ones of these before where we've had a building in the in one of the buffer zones actually Jay represented the client and they actually moved the the building back a few feet and that took care of the issue the buffer issues there um here being it looks like we still may have some disturbance even if they relocate those three buildings is the procedure for the applicant to come up with that drawing with the less impact and then hold the public hearing just on that part of it to get because they're saying we can't render a decision without public input so our code says we can't offer guidance or a decision on the built the dis disturbance in the riparian zone or the buffer without public input. So when do we solicit well, that public input? No. If if I might interject for just one second there, I, I think before we even get to that point, we, we have to get to the ZBA. Um but could your plan change based on the based on either what this board that's I'm kind of I know you got to go to the CBA to get a, I see you, Jay, hold on a second. You got to go to get your variance, but isn't there a potential for the plan to change based on the movements in the, out of the buffer zones to, to lessen the disturbance too, and then that would change the variance you would need? We would, we would actually submit a plan to the ZBA that, that shows building seven, eight, and nine relocated next to 10, 11, and 12. Um, it would show that to this planning board prior to that meeting, if so desired. Sorry, Jay. I stepped on you. No, that's fine. I, uh, Mike's I, Mike's got it right. We would, what we intend to do is uh, well, what we would like to do tonight is to get our referral to the CBA. Uh, no matter which way the uh, <clears throat> iteration of the plan is shown, it doesn't affect the the actual variances we need. We we need <laughs> lot area. It's, we, it's either it's lot area in these two front parking. It doesn't matter if the buildings are in the back or on the side. But what our what we intend to do is submit uh, the revised plan with the buildings on the side to the ZBA. Uh, we'll simultaneously uh, resubmit to you, uh, so you can see it. Um, and I think we're going to have to run parallel to uh, both boards parallel because I'm not sure if you're willing to consider a neg deck. I'm not sure when you're willing to consider it, but. Um, uh, we're going to need the neck deck before we can get the ZBA decision since it's a coordinated review. Yeah, my uh, thought on that, Jay, is, and actually maybe this is more for Natalie, some of the responses in that I proposed in the FEIF part two, <clears throat> really because there was so much impact by those buildings being <laughs> down there. Is there going to be a substantial modification? Like when they submit this revised plan, the, the board can refer them to the ZBA, but I think it is going to have to be a parallel path because I think when they submit the revised plan, they're going to need to update the part one to address some of these concerns. Um, this, yeah. it, do you agree, yeah. Natalie, that that's going to end up changing? Oh. I don't, I don't want to end up having to send them down the pause deck or the expanded part three mm -hmm. road if necessary, if, you know, that's what the FEIF part two comes to, if a lot of those are actually going to be resolved by pulling it out. Um, I think that there are still going to be issues in the part two that are separate from that would rise to the level of that expanded part three separate from just this water quality protection overlay issue. Um, I'm trying to go through it really quick to see if that's I know true. there's there's a, some aesthetics that are needed. The floodplain um, issue is separate. That's one thing that you know already kind of puts it up there. But one of the things I just want to kind of clarify is Although moving those buildings will eliminate potentially disturbance of the riparian zone, which per your code is prohibited, there is still going to be disturbance within the buffer area. And I think that really ultimately, and Mike and Jay, you can correct me if I'm wrong, I don't think that that's avoidable unless the reduction in intensity or, um, you know, a substantial change to the plan is uh, proposed and essentially or could be required by the board um, under zoning. So I think that those issues are still going to be relevant, um, you know, in, in advancing seeker as all. Well. So it's my understanding based on my working through these issues on a prior application that 
any disturbance within the buffer zone only is within the jurisdiction of the building inspector and it's not within the jurisdiction of the planning board. Is that still the case, Kelly? I'm going to have to look, but if it is part of your application to the planning board, I don't know why the planning board wouldn't be considering that. Um, I, I remember Mr. Golden a while no, back. No, no, he's okay. not here anymore. <laughs> no, I got don't that. pull the Rick I got card. That, but I do remember the advice. So if it's that's why I'm asking you if it's changed. But do you do you remember do, what application that was? I think it was it was Getter. 18 sky top i think it was, yeah, it was 18 18 sky top. Top. and yeah. i think that was because it was a residential use i think this this application because it falls to a site plan and special permit um then definitely falls to the planning sure. board for review okay. but all right but that's actually fine. i shouldn't say definitely we'll look well, at that if uh, i'll look because about... jay what it comes down to is i would have done the research then so oh. but i name things different on my end so natalie could come up and say oh it's named Frederick and I would not have a clue because I name it something different on my end. So that's why okay. I asked. Right. But so, I'll I'll take a look to see if you know what Natalie's saying is uh, correct, if what you're saying is correct. But regardless, I, I'm looking to move the project forward. Right. Um, but I see Mike raising his hand, so I'll let him yeah. know. You're talking about building inspector's opinion. You, you talked about the previous versus the current. It might be prudent to review it with the current inspector to see if he has a change in opinion so we don't hit a bump down the road. I'm, yeah, I think that sure was, was for a different it, issue. Right, it wasn't, I don't think it was for this particular issue. I think it was a legal opinion. Yeah, this but, issue deals with what the specific yeah. code says and who yeah. the code says will review this yeah. buffer area. The other one was what underlying zoning <clears throat> regulations would apply to the property based on the zone that it's in. So if we can get some clarity as to to what extent the planning board does have jurisdiction over development in the buffer zone only, that will be helpful. It seems, I, I think Mike has confirmed that if we do move these buildings off of the rear of the building to the side, we are eliminating any development in the riparian zone, which to me is a really good thing. Uh, I think it's a lot easier for us to remediate or mitigate uh, what we're going to be doing in the buffer than in the riparian zone. So um, uh, I think this is a good thing all around. Um, uh, so, uh, you know, again, Kelly, I'd, I'd like to see if we get this referred to the ZBA so we can at least get that ball rolling. I know they're at least a two meeting board and, you know, I, you know, it's always, you know, I always make sure that when I do this with the, uh, you know, I make sure that both boards know that uh, we're coordinating our efforts here. So, but it would good, be good to get that get that ball rolling. Can I ask a question, Kelly? Too actually, no. and I think that would be helpful for the board regarding. I'm with Chris. No, no, I'm just kidding. <laughs> Did you say no? No, I think it's a good question. Um, if the applicant goes to the ZBA and they get a variance for the density associated with the lot area for 12 units. Um, and then the planning board is still considering this issue of development of the riparian and buffer area. And we'll take the riparian out of it. It's the buffer area. And if the planning board has discretion to, you know, work with the applicant to say, to, to suggest and or require a reduction in intensity or say the number <clears throat> of units, it the planning board then isn't held to the ZBA variance. They can still make their determination under the water quality protection overlay, correct? Does that make sense? So what you're asking is if the ZBA grants a variance, say for like, I'm gonna use a different example. So if there's 12 houses and the ZBA grants a variance saying, okay, because of lot density, you can have 12 houses. And then the planning board is reviewing it and says, oh, under this, you can only have 11. The planning board does still have that jurisdiction under the other provisions of the code and its general planning powers. Yes. Okay. Did That's I get to what you were you were asking? Exactly it. We did. Okay. You just did that lawyer thing where you, you you answer a question with a question while you're trying to think of the answer. No, no, I so wasn't your... sure that I was understanding and I didn't want to use a bad example and have Jay say, we're not proposing a restaurant. And I was going to be like, oh my God. So, you know. 
So, I mean, yeah, I mean, I don't think the referral to the ZBA is out of out of the question here. I think we're reviewing the AF part two is probably a little premature at this point because it may change based on when those buildings come out of the riparian zone and the impacts, right? That's what I understand. Um, but what might be helpful too is, I mean, I sent the applicant a copy of the draft part two EAF. So um, they should have that. And when they submit the revised plans, pulling those units out of the uh, riparian area that they might have a bit more information to be able to submit with their submission if they want to at this time to try and address some of these issues. Obviously, it would still be identified in an FEAF part two, but it might further lend a hand and get them through the part three process faster. Because as Jay said, it's going to end up then being a parallel process where they can only go so far before the ZBA because they have to complete seeker with you, but you can't act until the ZBA then acts and then it goes yeah, back. We're in, a, we're in a weird spot. So I, I, I want to do do what's right to help the applicant move the application forward, but I also don't want to put anybody in a perilous spot either. That so, your recommendation is then, as council is for the referral to the ZBA, and then wait for the next submission for an updated e for the updated on the EAF part two. Yeah, I think that once I get the when they make that supplemental <clears throat> or new submission. Um, if they could update the EAF part one, I don't know how many changes it would actually cause, but just in case, if it takes something out of moderate to large impact to no or small, I think that's a big difference to them as the applicant. Mm -hmm. So they might wish for you to wait until you get a revised version. Well, you'll need the revised, you'll need the revised version and the supporting data in order to do, make a finding of your seat. Yeah. We know that. So okay. And if I could just point out if you're gonna if you're gonna uh adopt a resolution, refer this to the ZBA, it, it's there's two we, we have two paths for relief at the ZBA because we're in the uh, HP zone, it's for either a waiver and or a variance, since uh waiver authority is granted to uh, uh projects within the HP district. Right. Yes, I remember that's the one zone that has it's that ability. One, that's correct. Has that ability in it. Okay. Right. Well, with all this fun talk about repairing and buffer zones, and we haven't forgotten about you yet, Phil. We know you're still there. Um, does anybody from the board have comments <clears throat> on that part of the application? No. No, I know it was fairly straightforward. All right, Phil. Okay, I'll be quick. Uh, so we our November uh, 9th letter outlines uh, seven points that we'd like to get information on uh, the trip generation estimates based on ITE site distances at the driveway and evaluation of Fall Kirk Avenue and Smith Clove Road. Um, some discussion, description of uh, how school bus access and that works. Um, uh, look at how pedestrians will get from this facility to Smith Clove Road. Um, you know, so those are really the highlights in, in that letter. But uh, and, and looking at the site distances, not only at the access connection to Fall Kirk, but when they evaluate Smith Clove and Fall Kirk uh, intersection to look at the site distances there and identify any uh, recommended uh, improvements. So okay. it's outlined in our letter, but those are the, the key highlights. Thank you, sir. Does anybody have questions for Phil? Uh, I can just comment that uh, we, the good news is we are well on our way to getting that information should have to be shortly. Thank you. Yeah, I, I drove down there today and coming out of Falkirk, turning left onto Smith Clove, there's a building there. There's no bushes or anything. And it's only separated from the street by the sidewalk. It's really tough to get a good view. Uh, just you have to be aware of that. That's all. 
it's also a school bus stop that intersection correct as well i know i get stuck behind that bus every afternoon bringing my daughter home um all right but we'll we'll continue that's not not to be pushed we'll continue to discuss that as the process and the plans move along um the issues that we'll deal with all right uh so with that said i will offer a motion uh to refer this application uh to the zba for the needed variances second by evan any question all in favor aye aye all right and that's okay i'll see you at the zba <laughs> great and they thought they were getting december off we made sure that didn't happen they're not getting two months off in a row I just want to, yeah I just want Thanksgiving off at this point. Yeah, right. <laughs> Enjoy the turkey. Yeah. All right. Have a good night, everybody. Well, I know. Have good good holidays. The, the planning holidays board doesn't leave yet. We still have somebody. And I know. Have a good Thanksgiving, everybody. You too. Take care. Okay. Last but certainly not least, Hartman Leibowitz, 39 Catskill High Rail. Review and discuss documents submitted for ARB and Ridge Preservation of a proposed single family. Oh, uh, wow. Single family dwelling located at lot number 19 within the Woodbury Villas. Said property is located at 39 Catskill High Rail on Central Valley and is known as the Village of Woodbury Tax Map, Section 254, Block 1, Lot 19. And Mr. Kelp is back. Good evening again, sir. Hi. Okay. Hi. Um, you're, you're becoming an old hand at this. <laughs> okay. So basically, um, we are hit the Tier time, and I hope it will be the last time of that, of that project. Um, so basically, the last time we have some comments, um, and we have revised the site plan accordingly. Um, so we have revised all the slopes to be um, three to one. Um, all the proposed um, grading should be three to one, and we have proposed um, landscaping between the existing clearing line and the old proposed clearing line. Um, and then I see, that, um, so this is basically what we submitted now again. And now we hear back, um, hopefully for a final vote, we got an approval. Okay, thank you, sir. Uh, the board have the questions for the applicant before we go to Natalie? All right, go ahead now. You, you a little light tonight. It's only one. It's only one sheet of paper. Yeah, I think I could be really brief on this one. <laughs> no, seriously though, um, the applicant has been before you twice. Uh, before this, they at the last appearance you requested they consider mitigations for the portion of the lot that was cleared by the developer. Um, that should have been retained for the original approval. Um, the board should consider the revised plans and whether the additional landscaping that's proposed is appropriate. Uh, you've previously concluded seeker. You waived the public hearing requirement, uh, confirming the site is not visible from the view corridor. Uh, the rest of our comments on the plan are relatively minor. Uh, we've included some additional considerations for the grading and maintaining mobile condition where the proposed grading meets the existing grade. Um, also at your last meeting, I think the board requested foundation plantings, which should be added to the plan. Um, We've also asked for confirmation on the number of bedrooms proposed um, and if needed, the projected water and sewer demand form updated. Uh, the ARB form should be updated to include the gross floor area of the home. Uh, but in our opinion, the rest of those comments could be managed as conditions of your action if you um, choose to authorize the preparation of a draft resolution of approval. So that's all I had. Okay, so Thank you, Nana. Reply to that. To yeah. To that um, regarding the grading, um, the all proposed grading in the back, um, it's it's three to one. And then on the right side of the driveway, um, again, it, I didn't have a chance to confirm with the engineer, Jay Samuelson, that it's three to one, but I'm gonna definitely reach out to him to make sure the proposed grading on the right side of the, of the um, driveway, like you mentioned in your comment, that is also just three to one. And then your comment about the southern side on the property, um, it's existing grading, so we're not proposing anything that it's um, graded in three to one. So I think this is 
just I, I will just submit a new, a new site plan with, to confirm that on the right side on the parking that we where we are proposing the grade that it's just three to one. So let's if we can just discuss that for one second. So my exception to the grading right now is that, for instance, if somebody goes to mow the lawn next to the driveway and that portion of the home, they would encounter something that would be a three to one in a mowable condition and then something that isn't and it could cause an issue say like an overturning of a mower or something like that. So I think that there's an opportunity there to adjust the grading a little bit further and create sort of a safer condition. Um, so if you could just take a, a quick look at that uh, with your engineer and advise, um, I'd appreciate it. But I would like to see sort of more of a gently sloping situation in that, in that situation there. I just want to make sure that um, I understand. Uh, can I share my screen to make sure that I... Yeah. Okay. Go ahead. Or we could just get the applicant a uh, lawnmower with a roll cage. <laughs> so I want to make sure that um, you are thinking about this slope on the right side. No, I mean, well, that should be confirmed, but I think I'm less concerned about your proposed grading as much as it is where the 880, 882, 884, where your mouse is, how that ties into the existing grade there. So even if that is three to one, this existing grade isn't. So it would encounter kind of an issue with how it's just meeting up and marrying without, it would be too sharp in my opinion. Mm -hmm. Okay, so, but, so what you are thinking is to fill in a little bit here. Yeah, I think you, so a, mm -hmm. you might be able to extend that grading, um, you know, just to kind of create a, a more gentle transition. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay, I understand. I will get, I, I will reach out to, to the engineer to, to address that. And then regarding the landscaping, um, I don't think, um, as I saw that in my submission, all the neighboring houses, I don't see they should have um, planting in front of the house, but the foundation planting. So again, if this is something what it's going to make happy um, for the board, um, I can ask him just if it's no needed. Um, I think um, we should not put it as, as a part of the, I think he can anyway put something, but I don't see in the surrounding houses they should have something. So I think it's important it should be a part of the approvals. And I just would, would like to note that the applicant did put three, six, nine, 12, is putting 12 trees, I believe, in the back, right? That was all cleared cleared out? Correct. Okay. So they, ha they have a, uh, agreed to do some planting in the rear of the house to replace the of open. Course. Yes. You see on the, on the plan between the two the two um, um, lines, they have the this. So actually, we spread it out in the entire area to be able to grow and green out the entire area. Okay. Foundation plantings team. I, mean, I don't think it should be totally bare. Can you just drop a couple plants there and call it yeah, a day? Just, yeah, just a little something, something there. Yep, I agree. Okay. But I don't think, um, other than that, I don't think we need to hold up a uh, resolution for uh, drafting resolution approval, right? Does everybody else come with this application? Yeah, agreed. Okay. So I'll offer a motion to uh, have council draft a resolution of approval for this application. Second. Second by Evan. Any questions? <clears throat> All in favor? Aye. 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 All right, Mr. Gelt. Thank you so much. So Thank you, I, sir. I will get back with all the stuff so you're going to be able to find less resolution. And to yeah, so just so you know, what we're going to do is that we'll we'll take action at the next meeting. They'll, they'll just be conditions now at this point as far as you're getting that information back to us. So you won't have another appearance. You won't personally have to appear before the board again. It will just be handled in the in the conditions of the resolution. Okay. Thank you so much. Have Thank you, sir. Have a good night. Thank you. Oh, nine o'clock. Not bad. I thought that was going to go much. I thought that was going to go much later tonight for some reason.
All right. What, Kelly's no is long enough, right? No, no, I was going to say, really? It, it was dark at like four. It feels like it's midnight. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I know. It's a long day. All right. Well, um, with there being no further business above uh, before the board, uh, I offer a motion to close. Second. Tommy, any questions? Anybody just want to hang out and chat for a little while? Everybody have a great Thanksgiving. Everybody have a great uh, Thanksgiving. Uh, Kelly, did you get that email? Happy Thanksgiving. Happy Thanksgiving. I did, and I took care of that already. Thank you. Good night. Good night. Good night, everybody. Good night.